So the U.S. Business Roundtable, Mr. Kumar, is urging all companies to serve all stakeholders, you know, supply chain partners, people in the distribution network, employees, customers. How is the State Bank of India responding to this shift? So for the world, it may be a new shift. But let me tell you that we made this shift way back in 1955. Oh, tell us more. You're ahead of the curve. <laughs> 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 so, the State Bank has a very long history, okay. starting from 1806. And uh, it's 1921, Imperial Bank of India. Essentially, it was set by the Scottish people during the British rule. Mm -hmm. And it was a trader's bank, essentially. A trader's bank, yes. A trader's bank. Right. Until 1955, it was an honor to have a checkbook book of Imperial Bank of India. Sure. So it was a very elitist bank, you guys. But 1955, it got created under an act of Parliament, SBI Act, and it was a result of a survey which was done for the rural credit. Mm -hmm. So this was the genesis of the State Bank of India in 1955, and suddenly from an elitist bank, where having a checkbook was a privilege, yes. it became a bank for mass banking with a focus on rural India rural India and providing their credit needs through a formal system. India is a very informal system, high cost of credit for the rural people. So it was envisaged that if India has to develop, we need an institution which can meet the need of the informal rural economy people. And, yeah. Yes. So that was the genesis. And I always say that we are rediscovering all the things, but our purpose, our origin, has been very different and subsequently carrying that forward. Many big, many new initiatives were taken by State Bank of India. MSME today is a buzzword, but 1965, we were the first one to start MSME lending in India. 1970, we set up agriculture development branches mm -hmm. across the country. So, till 1991, we were 100% owned by the government. Right. And when the reforms were initiated in India in 1991, then there was again a huge paradigm shift where in 93 we got listed. Right. And then the... Then the challenge begins. begins. <laughs> so that was going to lead me to my next question is you're in a very unique position because on one hand you are a listed company so you have shareholders to answer to. They are expecting you to create value for them. But you're also a public sector bank with a strong social mission. How do you balance the two then? Well, it is a challenge. And many times I wish that we did not have quarterly results. <laughs> it would be much better if it was. Sure, <laughs> yes. Well, I'm glad you didn't think about that. <laughs> and uh, there are certain costs associated with social life. That is a fact. And uh, for example, 41% of my network of branches, by the way, we have 22,200 branches in the country. So a it's a big country number, and yes. uh, it's a big bank. And uh, when you're serving such a vast, vast population, vast population so 41% of my branches contribute 14% of my business and profits. Yeah. So that is an implied cost of the social bank. But we have to do that, we do. What happens, it gets reflected in the valuation of the bank mm -hmm. automatically because the investor community I don't think they give enough value to what we are doing in the social banking area. It is all about years, PE multiples, your quarterly earnings. And that is where the valuations of State Bank of India today are not what they ought to be, in my view. Uh, <clears throat> simply if I give some of the numbers and facts to put what we do, as I said, that we are 250,000 people. Mm -hmm. 22,200 branches. I have 59,000 customer service points. 59,000 customer service points across which the country. We, across the country, which we manage through our business correspondence. Okay. It's a partnership. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then network of 60,000 ATMs. It's a phenomenal network. It yes. is a phenomenal network and it has its own cost source. And the number of customers exceeds 430 million. 
for th that's like the population of a small country. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, big country. We are bigger than you. <laughs> <laughs> I, am I am serving right. more number of people than living in U.S. So almost, yes. uh, you can say Europe and uh, minus in Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the population that, yeah. we saw. So obviously, as I said, that it has costs and that gets reflected in our profit. So people ask me that, when will you get 2% ROI? Yeah. Which is like many private sector banks. In I, will, I always say never. Never. <laughs> never. <laughs> Because for me to keep an ROI of 90 basis point to 1 percent yes. is good enough. Right. <laughs> right. So, you know, uh, India is going through its sharpest slowdown in six years, you know, and very few people, companies are spending. Certainly, top tier businesses are holding back before they're expanding, before they're borrowing. Um, at the same time, you are the largest lender in India, so yes, you have to serve. Um, top tier companies, but you also have to serve the, the smaller ones because that is your responsibility. So given the slowdown now, are you worried you'll have to lend a little bit more to companies, say, with uh, lower credit ratings? Because maybe they're the ones who are willing to expand in this environment. And if you do that, it's going to have an impact on, could have an impact on your non-performing assets or bad loans, which is a huge problem for Indian banks. No, I don't think that we are going to dilute any of the underwriting standards. Mm. But we do keep on interacting with various industries, various industry associations. And wherever there is a dialogue about where they feel that there are certain policy issues uh, which are, say, are very tight, and if we believe in the bank that, yes, we can do some relaxations. So we do some policy-level interventions time to time and respond to the requirement of the industry. That is a uh, normal process, I would call it. And uh, we keep on reviewing. We have a very large risk management department which sets up industry exposure limits, limits on underwriting and uh, uh, diversification of portfolio. So I don't think that in the uh, pursuit for growth, mm -hmm. there would be any dilution in the underwriting standards. But there are enough opportunities which will be there there is a slowdown, which I believe is a transitory phase. And there were a lot of reforms in the four five years which have impacted the private sector investment. But uh, on the back of the huge potential for investment in infrastructure, and the population is still India is a growing population. Mm. It is an aspirational India. We are doing a lot of work in the technology. It's a hub. Mm -hmm. And uh, the startup universe is very good. They, they seem to have solution for every problem. <laughs> so, uh, what is the one that excites you the most? Uh, no, which for the banking, like, uh, yeah, for, for we had a full, full one and a half day presentation of, from many fintechs for our board. Right. And the amazing capabilities this fintechs are creating. Yeah. So uh, when you have such a good intellectual capital, Maybe its impact on the productivity gains are yet to be reflected. Right. But uh, that is a very encouraging thing about India. We have our own problems about like population growth. Yes. That is a problem. Then still uh, we are at the beginning of the development, <coughs> I would say, with $2,000 per capita income. Yeah, so a lot, lot of uh, ground is uh, still waiting to be, to be waiting to be covered. The now potential and the opportunities are huge. How do we put certain policies in place which enables the private sector investment to invest? And anybody invest with when they get your expected return on equity. Right. That is simple. Nobody yeah. invests out of love for anything. Right. So, right. <laughs> so uh, that is a simple form. Yeah. Otherwise, people are happy giving money with the State Bank of India, CFS Bank, so no problem. But when they take this, then naturally they expect a lot. And uh, there are a lot of steps taken by the government for ease of doing business. But still, I think there are roadblocks and which needs to be removed. If we do these two things, I don't think that uh, there is an issue about the 
growth opportunities in India. Now, in 2015, Prime Minister Modi announced these mudra loans, yeah. which are small ticket loans um, meant to encourage small and uh, medium enterprises to help that uh, part of the economy grow. But the problem is, a lot of these small ticket loans are turning into bad loans. People are not being able to pay them back. And that seems like a real serious cause for concern because the problem of bad loans is a significant one for India's banking sector, isn't it? I think it is overstated, the problem, the size of the problem. Of these loans not being paid back? No. There are NPS. In yes. percentage terms, it is high. Right. But in absolute <laughs> amount from bank's balance sheet perspective, it is not very high. Insignificant? Insignificant. So just to give you an idea that uh, uh, the mudra loans yeah. are uh, less than 1% of my loan book. Less than 1%. But the problem is, it may be less than 1%, so financially it may not move the needle. But how then, what is the best tool for financial inclusion? Because in principle, this is an excellent idea to make these loans available for small and medium enterprises. But if that's not going to work, what, according to you, is the best tool for financial inclusion? So financial inclusion, one is that uh, there are several dimensions to financial inclusion. One is that we have done quite well in terms of coverage. And, you mean in reaching areas? Uh, in reaching areas under. and opening of account and bringing people into the formal banking system. Okay. As I mentioned that uh, we have a 430 million customer base. So 130 million is uh, the accounts which get classified under financial inclusion, and which is a big number. Right. Again, and uh, the service is all through uh, business correspondent channels. And uh, social security schemes, again, there are quite a few which are being extended to all these account holders. Third part is about the availability of credit. Three enablers uh, which now we are using. One is the underwriting model mm -hmm. itself, which is data analytics. Okay. So that is a shift. Today, the State Bank, we have developed capability that end-to-end -end disbursement mm -hmm. of this loan, all technology driven, digitized process. Okay. So a person comes to one of our say, business correspondent or this thing, they apply, no uh, paperwork, digital and then throughout, digital digital throughout and the loan can get disbursed. And, uh, it is a 10, 15 minutes process. And uh, it is all uh, model, uh, underwriting model which we have generated. So success rate is low. Mm -hmm. So maybe uh, 7 out of 100 will get this loan, right? 7 out of 100, okay. But those 7, we believe that the delinquencies will be almost zero. So those will be almost perfect? Almost perfect. Got it. Second is the partnership model, mm -hmm. where there are a lot of microfinance institutions in the country. And uh, banks like us, we are allowed to partner with them for what we call co-origination or online, both are permitted. Third is the collection machine. So through this, what these loans also need is that uh, uh, more feet on the street to collect these loans and by the people who are part of that community. So local community Local leaders. community because a bank like us, which is a nationalized bank, and yeah. Uh, we have our own uh, policies for relocation of people and right. those kind of things. So that local community connect uh, is, is missing. Is missing. Right. Okay. But the microfinance institutions, non-banking financial companies, they provide that connect. So we have the balance sheet strength, mm -hmm. low cost form. Mm -hmm. We have the partners who have the last mile connectivity, connectivity capability to collect on those loans because most of their people who are in this collection business, uh, they are part of that community, they understand where they are local people. So it is a very sort of, an, I would say, an ideal model where you use technology and you use partnership model. And my last question before you go, and I know you have another meeting, is demonetization. We're three years on from that. We're back to the same levels of cash in the economy. The goal was to take out, suck out black money from the economy and increase equality. Three years on, do you think it was worth the effort? 
Uh, I believe so, yeah. because a uh, lot of uh, people came into the formal s system. As a result of demonetization? As a result of the demonetization. Mm -hmm. Currency as percentage of GDP has not gone. Yeah. And the digital transactions have increased almost four or five times. Yeah, it had to because no one had cash. There were no notes. Yeah. So what do you do? <laughs> Everyone was struggling Everyone with that. Everyone was uh, the same. So uh, the the uh, demonetization, you cannot view its benefit in a short period. Right. These are some far-reaching uh, reforms, and which have impacted the lot. So three. And in the, for a country like India, again, uh, everybody is working that. The payment system uh, is efficient, uh, it is safe and secure, and the cost of doing transaction is kept, and that is happening. And today, uh, UPI, uh, this is an innovation which has come up from India, and uh, many countries in fact are now uh, very, uh, sort of with a lot of interest, are looking at this model. So it is like we are talking now about open banking uh, there in Europe or UK. But uh, UPI is a sort of open banking already initiated mm -hmm. uh, in India. So India is stack, which is a technology stack. It's a very fine example of public-private partnership. That's right. All the digital infrastructure created by the government and widely being used by the <coughs> private players like us. Mm -hmm. So that way, again, a very great enabler uh, in terms of uh, digitization. But for a country like India, as I said, that uh, population is so big, so you will need everything. That's you right. need cash, you need digital. Exactly. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Please join me in thanking you. Thank you.